from the Catholic Underground. Today on the show, two popes become saints, both in amazing ways. There's a new encyclical on our shelves penned by two other popes, and there are a few problems with the PDF. Our picks of the week, so much more. The Catholic Underground starts now. Alrighty, it's time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 233. I'm Father Chris Decker. If you're listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on in the chat room. A special welcome to our listeners around the world on the radio and on the interwebs. Joining me this week, we've got Kathleen Lee. She is a teacher at St. Joseph's Academy. She is our resident faith ninja. Hello, Kathleen. Hello. Also, Jeff Blackwell, technical director of the Catholic Underground and audio guide du jour. He services the exhaust ports on the Jeff Star <laughs> 1 near-Earth orbit satellite. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Father. Yes, indeed. You'll notice that Jeff is uh, is is nursing a frog back to health inside his throat. It's a, I'm catching a healing. That's yeah. right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but we're glad you're here nonetheless. We've also got Mary-Kate Taylor, a sentient being in possession of a luminescent and generally immortal soul. And, and director today. I and she, That's right. She She's directing on video today. <laughs> so uh, direct all complaints to Mary-Kate Taylor. That's right. Care of Mary-Kate Taylor. We've also got a very special guest with us, Chris Williston. He is a father of children, a husband of a wife, and one of the founders of Austin Catholic New Media. Hello, Chris. Hi, Father Decker. How's it going? It's going wonderfully, wonderfully. Well, we thought that we would uh, we would start the show as we did last time with uh, with Jason, your your partner in Could Be Crime. Um, just find out a little bit about you, Chris. Well, thank you. It's yeah. a, an absolute pleasure. Long-time listener, first-time caller here to the show. Of course. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Jason said last week, he said, I had to remember that I wasn't just listening to the show, but that I could actually speak because it was actually happening. You know, usually I'm I'm going back and forth with you guys either way, so now it's just nice that, that you'll actually be able to reciprocate. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, I do appreciate that. Yeah, I, I am a, a father of four wonderful children here in, in Austin, seven, six, three, and one. Those are their, their ages, not their names. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, seven of seven. Yeah. <laughs> seven of seven. Yeah. And they're awesome, awesome kids. I, I also, of course, am, am married to my wonderful wife, Michelle, and a founder of Austin Catholic New Media. You know, Austin Catholic New Media is a digital apostolate here in Austin and really globally because, mm-hmm. you know, we... We have Nigerian princes contact us all the time who want to send us money. <laughs> so I figure they must be listening. They must be reading. They like what we do. That, that's exactly <laughs> right. And and it turns out that the more money you send to Nigeria, uh, the the more that they actually contact you, right? Yeah, it, it is. It's it's amazing. So yeah. we're sowing the seeds in Nigeria. We're waiting for it to to come back to us, but it's all good. It's all good. But no, I mean the most important work of my life course is working to sanctify the entire world through the vocation of marriage and i'm i'm awfully blessed to be married to a a wonderful lady it turns out that somebody's been reading their catechism mm-hmm. oh, something like that yeah, that's exactly right <laughs> so so very good well uh, well chris welcome to the show as i say it's a standing invitation you're always welcome and Thank uh you. let's get into the nitty-gritty here shall we uh blessed john paul the great second miracle was validated by the causes for the saints and uh, that's right, folks. That means that he is going to be very soon here, Saint John Paul. I, I believe the way that it works, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, is that you, you put um, Saint as the second thing. So you would say Pope Saint John Paul II. That's my, that's my memory. Usually I, that's the way that it works. Earlier yeah. I said Pope Saint, and it didn't sound right. No. I was trying to tell my kids and explain to them what was, what was happening with the, with the canonization of John Saint, Pope, John Paul II. Did I just do it right? You, I, yeah, I don't know. Pope I Saint. confused myself. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so, there you go. So the the long the short of it is is that second miracle was was approved by the causes for the saints, which uh, which is a, a really beautiful thing that that it was done, and uh, it's really neat too that it's uh, it's somebody that's that's still alive that is actively talking about um, what what was done, and uh, and so that uh, that's that's how it begins. Uh, and uh, what's also interesting is is that another Pope saint is about to be a saint, um, and that is John the Twenty Third. Now you'll remember from your reading that John the Twenty Third is the Holy Father that uh, convened the Second Vatican Council, and he will be proclaimed a saint, but in in a rather non-standard way. Um, normally, you have to go through a rather long, lengthy process of investigation. Um, in fact, Jeff, as you remember, part of that is whenever 
um, you become a servant of God, a venerable, a blessed, and then a saint. Well, all these components, uh, things happen, and one of them is you have to have miracles attributed to you. Right. Okay. And uh, John the Twenty Third has not had the second miracle attributed, but Pope Francis has waived that um, that requirement uh, in favor of acclaiming him as a as a saint by decree. He's he's decreeing that that he is a saint, and uh, as you know, Kathleen, popes can do that. Yes, yes, they can. That's right. Uh, so that's great and all, but I find it interesting that uh, that they are being proclaimed together. I think perhaps folks might have wanted well John Paul II to have his own you know, big day. Uh, and yet they are, they are in fact proclaiming them together. And I was thinking about that a little bit earlier. And of course, as he often does, Father Zulsdorf over at What Does the Prayer Really Say, um, preceded me in thought. And he began to write about it um, because he's actually good with his blog. And um, <laughs> his hypothesis is, is really interesting. So I thought we'd chat about it a little bit here. Uh, he says that um, canonizing the two together makes an important connection with the year of faith and the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council, because you know we're in the year of faith at the moment. And uh, he says that by canonizing the one who called the council and the one who spoke extensively on it, in a way, Vatican II itself is being canonized. Um, and then he suggests that in canonizing John Paul II with John XXIII, uh, John Paul II really becomes the hermeneutic, which is the $10 word that means the, the lens, the means for interpreting the council, John Paul the two, the, John Paul the two is mm-hmm. uh, is being. <laughs> I think I just came up with something even further than Pope Saint Pope Saint John Paul the two um, is is providing perhaps in his writings uh, a way to to look at the council whenever there are any questions about it. So in a sense, John Paul II's writings become canonized mm-hmm. you know, whenever someone is named a saint. Um, so I find that really. Do you think? Do you think that that there could be some some credence to that, uh, Chris, or um, is this just one of those neat coincidences? It certainly seems to make sense. I mean, it, uh, definitely, John Paul II brought a coalescing. I think of of many of the themes of Vatican II really brought them um, mm-hmm. brought them to the people in a way that they could that they could understand. Yeah. And so I, I like this as as a validation mm-hmm. of of the council and of I, I don't know if there's I don't know if there's any credence. I mean I don't know if somebody in the Vatican was thinking, you know what would be a great idea <laughs> and, and kind of <laughs> sent that to Pope Francis or if this was of his mind or if it just is a creation of Father Z, but but I'll go with it. Sure. It's a good conspiracy theory. That's exactly right. <laughs> and it's else. one of the it's one of the good kinds of conspiracy too. Indeed. You know, it's it's Indeed. um it's one where um, as, as Father Z says, there, there are plenty of controversial texts in the documents of the Second Vatican Council. Mm-hmm. We, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago uh, in terms of um, just uh, with Cardinal Casper saying, you know, some of the things in the council were meant to be um, l- fluid. Um, well, even in the midst of the so-called fluidity that may have been intended, it really wasn't a document that John Paul II didn't speak about during the length of his papacy. In fact, he was, he was a bishop at the council. He helped to write important passages like uh, Gaudium et Spes. Um, he, he really commented on just about every controversial topic. And so it really does make sense that, uh, that you know, to kind of couple him with John XXIII, uh, there would be some sort of a connection there. I don't know. Kathleen, you're probably just excited that there are popes being canonized, huh? especially that they're in living memory. I mean, this is a saint that... Like Mother Teresa, you saw in action. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, you know John Paul, John Paul II um, is one of my favorites, and it was really cool to get um, an email from one of my students. We had mm-hmm. signed up for the Pope Alarm when they oh, had yeah. done the, the canonization, and, and they had another canonization. The, um, the election, the conclave was yeah. the C word I was looking for, but um, you know, and one of my students had gotten an email about John Paul II being canonized and she sent it to me. She's like, look at this. <laughs> um, so it was really cool. I talked about him in my class and um, he's, not, he's not hard to get people fired up about. I was going to um, say, do your students really dig John Paul II? Yes. And, you know, they, they don't really know him. And mm-hmm. so, you know, when you talk about, we, we read his, I'd say this the time, we read his letter to women. Uh-huh. And they, beautiful, you know, beautiful letter. You know, I teach in an all-girls school and they were just blown away by the, by the words of, a, of you know, a celibate, priest pope you know um, yeah. a celibate man in our church who talks so lovingly about women and um and i was like guess what this isn't it you know and i handed them all kinds of other stuff just to yeah. to walk away with it they could read it so easy to read his writings 
um, is so passionate, so beautiful. Um, well, so. It's, it's easy to read the ones he intends to be easy to read. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the second. That, yes, they can be very difficult. Yeah, they they can be. I'm just looking at the the original text of the theology of the body. The the primary mm. text itself is, it's it's gymnastics for your brain. Mm. You it is. Know? It is. I think it's tough too when we're talking about the beatification of both of these popes. I'm sorry, with the canonization of both these popes. Mm -hmm. It's hard because you know I was born in 1982. The yeah. the only pope that I knew until 2000 was it six was was Bye. John Paul II. Yeah. Right. And so there's not that emotional connection to John 23rd. Right. But when I was in Rome back in November, mm -hmm. I traveled with a couple of pilgrims who were older yeah. and certainly remembered John the 23rd and they they really spoke lovingly about him in in much the same way that that many of us speak about John Paul II. So, I think it's hard for some of us, especially the the younger crowd if you will, yeah. to to really to really connect with this canonization. Yeah. But, At least on that on that side, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I was but, thinking about that with Kathleen is that a lot of the the Pope that most of the girls that she teaches knew, know know it, that that's a uh, that's Benedict the Sixteenth right mm -hmm. you know would you say Father that also this sort of canonization that you're that he's speaking of could also reflect how a lot of times Vatican II is taken out of context and people can um, interpret it through the ortho, through the orthodox means that it was originally intended there's a lot of times I think that people take Vatican II as a license. And when he's talking about canonizing it, I can't really <laughs> right. can't really say the word right now for some reason. Uh -huh. Canonizing, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. JP that, the two, JP perhaps, the two canonized. <laughs> that perhaps yeah. he's talking about the, an infusion of um, the real yeah. um, valid meaning behind it. Well, I think that there, there's there's definitely some possibility of that. You know, if if John Paul II, um, as a saint who spoke extensively on the council and now has all of these writings, I'm just thinking about how in the Office of Readings in the Liturgy of the Hours. There are there are extensive readings uh, that show up during the year on um, from the different vacu <laughs> vacuums documents of Vatican II. We're not the only ones doubling. <laughs> Man, the words what is today. up? With? I like that though. I think we just coined a new phrase yeah. though. The Va Va Vatican kind of document cool. would be a vacuum. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. Um, and so I wonder if we're going to see in the revision of the Liturgy of the Hours, since it's supposedly coming within the next decade, are we going to see some of the writings of John Paul II? Um, as a supplement to um, maybe the dogmatic constitution on the sacred liturgy or something of that nature. I, I think that there really could be a beautiful lens by which to interpret the council rather than have um, just kind of license, as you say, Mary-Kate, because uh, it's easy to do that. It's easy to kind of read in. I mean, we do this with Scripture all the time without the interpretive body that is the magisterium in those 2,000 years of, of lived tradition. You can take a passage from the Bible and, uh, and just go start plucking people's eyes out. But you have to have yeah. a, a hermeneutic to, uh, to, to measure that by, to interpret that by. And um, I think that, that uh, JP2's um, writings could certainly do that. In fact, it's interesting that, um, that Benedict XVI may have also kind of suggested that there is some validity to uh, certainly to, to maybe John Paul II's writings, but also that the Second Vatican Council was 100% valid. Uh, he said in his letter to the Society of St. Pius X, as you know, which is the schismatic group, he said, one cannot freeze the magisterial authority of the church in 1962, and this must be quite clear to the fraternity, he said, but to some of those who show off as great defenders of the council, it must also be recalled to memory that Vatican II contains within itself the whole doctrinal history of the church. Who wants to be obedient to it, i.e. the council, must accept the faith of the centuries and must not cut the roots of which the tree lives. And, and I think the Holy Father uh, Emeritus now um, really is, is suggesting that we, we do, as with all things, even with Scripture, have to read the Second Vatican Council within the context of the wider church. We've got to look at it in the context of our salvation history. Because if we don't do that, well, we, we do risk splintering off. Uh, and, and people have splintered even with the Second Vatican Council, you know. So, so this is a, is a very good thing. Uh, we thank Father Z for doing the, some of the research on this topic for us. Um, and uh, and we, we certainly want to know what you think, so you can go to... Uh, Backchat at CatholicUnderground.com in your email browser if you want. Yep. By the way, the the, the road to sainthood yep. takes dozens of years, sometimes is it Even centuries? more. Yeah, yeah, it can. Mm -hmm. So um, this is kind of like the fast track. How long do you think it'll be before it's officially... Well, I, I believe, uh, I know all of the Catholic uh, pilgrimage and tour groups are planning on October. Mm -hmm. That yeah. soon? Wow. 
I, I had heard, however, that the that the Vatican was saying that that was too quick. Uh-huh. That, that was too quick, and that they wanted a little bit more time to make the preparations in Rome yeah. for the obviously the huge number yeah. of folks who are going to be traveling to Rome for the for the canonization. Can't so even imagine possibly December. Yeah, which would be a little I, more realistic, I guess. Sounds like travel agents. Would. It sounds like travel agents have a lobby there. Uh. <laughs> Possibly. Well, and and Jeff, let me tell you, with with just with Pope Francis right now, yeah, um, it is impossible to get to his Sunday Angelus is and the right? Wednesday audience. It is near impossible. Right. You would think that, oh well, he's been Pope for a few months now. You know, um, people are going to stop uh, flooding the square. It's 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 packed. Just insane. Yeah. So I can only imagine for John the Twenty Third, which, as Chris said, um, our our elder crowds remember because he was he he will always be the smiling Pope, the Pope right. of the people in in that sense, mm-hmm. and uh, that's going to attract that crowd. Uh, and then, of course, John Paul II. I mean, they're going to have like six World Youth Days happening <laughs> at that. Yeah. You know, um, because John Paul II is still very fresh in the memory, certainly of young adults now. Sure. You know, so that's that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing that is exciting too is that uh, two popes have been doing something very beautiful. As you know, we've talked about the the encyclicals of Benedict the Sixteenth and uh, faith and, or I should say, hope and love um, were were the themes of those. Well, uh, his his third encyclical on faith was uh, he was finished by Pope Francis. And so basically all of the notes on his encyclical on faith were, were given to Pope Francis, and Pope Francis put his own unique uh, spin, if you will, uh, on this encyclical. And it's it's kind of a weird thing because it's almost, Chris, like a, a, a kind of a quasi-ghost-written encyclical. It is. I, I found myself as I was reading it, and I, and I will say I'm savoring it. I've, mm-hmm. I'm about halfway through. Yeah. Uh, I, I found myself kind of wondering, okay, is this is this a Pope Benedict section or is this a Pope Francis section? <laughs> yeah, I, same thing happened to me. I at, at every turn. But yeah. it's, it's it's really an excellent read because we don't know exactly. We don't know how Pope Francis sounds in an official church document. Exactly. Yet. We we know how he sounds in in his daily mass homilies, which I think Kathleen can agree have been pretty awesome. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so we we don't quite yet know what what that looks like on paper when he's writing in in an official voice uh, of of the church, uh, that magisterial document that is uh, an encyclical. But I have to say there are really some beautiful gems in it, and uh, I'm I'm like you, Chris. I've I've only savored maybe halfway through, and uh, I'm still highlighting and pondering. Definitely, but. but- Mm-hmm. Devotionally, a, a, a tremendous reminder, really right up front in the first 20 pages, Father Chris. I think so often, you know, I, I personally, especially when I go to, to adoration, mm-hmm. I'm, I find myself, you know, oh, I'm thinking, oh, I'm looking at Jesus. I'm, I'm in the presence of Jesus. There's a, there's a beautiful reminder right up front, and, and that is cyclical, that, that the life of faith, the goal of faith is not to look at Jesus, but to see the world through the eyes of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And to me, that that has been a wonderful meditation over the last couple of, well, I guess really just the last week, obviously, since the encyclical came out. But yeah. th- there was something so profound about it. And maybe it's duh, and maybe there's people listening who are kind of like hitting their head against the wall going, "That's d- did you not know that? <laughs> but it's such a reminder to me that yeah. you know, it's not just about looking at Jesus, it's looking – looking at the world like Jesus and, mm-hmm. and and looking on it with compassion and love and and it's just it meant a lot to me. It was it was excellent. Yeah, because I think we can get into that stage that 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 we can almost kind of freeze um like Peter um on the mountaintop. He 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 was basically going to adoration whenever Christ was transfigured before him. And mm. faith all of a sudden just bled away into into realized glory. And what did Peter say? He was, he was so freaked out by the fact that here is the glorified Lord in front of him. He says, it's good that we're here. Let's just let's build some tents. We're going to have a big feast right here, and we're just going to hang here. Right. Why would you ever want to leave that place? Why, why right. would you ever want to leave adoration when it's very clear who is there? Right. And yet Jesus, he comes down from having his clothes dazzling white, and he says, we've got to get to Jerusalem. Because otherwise, this glorification preview they saw doesn't mean a thing. And so it is with faith. And I think you're right, Chris, that, that um, we are called to move into those moments of adoration so that we can allow our eyeballs to be transformed, huh? spiritually and 
maybe physically as well. And then so that we can begin to, on our own journeys towards the Jerusalems in our lives, so that we can finally see with that wisdom of the cross, that wisdom that says we, we've got to keep moving, we, we've got to keep going, and we've got to drag as many people with us as we can mm. and invite them into lumen fide, huh? we, the, the light of faith. And as you say, he, he talks about how faith is, is linked to, to not just wanting to, to see with our eyes, but it's also, as he mentions, um, it's linked to hearing as well. Because Abraham hears the voice of God. He doesn't see his face, but he hears the voice of God. And he actually, in hearing that, that personal voice, uh, the, the popes say that faith takes on a personal aspect. He's not like a, a, a Roman pagan god that is the god of a specific place, you know, it's like the god of Austin or a god of Baton Rouge, because that was very common in those days. You had these uh, civic gods. No, God, the, the true God, he, he recognizes, he allows us to recognize him as a personal God, in a sense, a God that goes with us, and, and that is in, in establishing his covenant with, uh, with Abraham. He is engaging with us personally, and so he really is inviting us into a life that we can live if, as you say, Chris, we, we take a step outward and we begin to live a life uh, that actually manifests God to others, or in our case, Christ to others, you know? Were there any other nuggets that kind of struck you on the head? Proverbially? <laughs> <laughs> I have to go back and look at my, yeah. my Facebook timeline, because that's where I've been. Every time I find, you know, that, that line that just speaks to my heart, I've, I've been going and, and posting it over there. Yeah. Now, I mean, that was it. I, I think this is this is one of the reasons. There is, um, so often in, in the writings, and, and there was... Uh, in this, in the speaking of of someone like uh, Saint Mother Ter- Mother Saint Ter- Saint Mother Teresa, <laughs> yeah. you would you'd you'd hear her seeing the face of Christ in the the sick and the suffering. Yes, and I guess so. So often I thought, you know, did did she really, or is that just a manner of speech mm-hmm. or whatever? And yet, and yet, here is this this whole calling to say, yes, that's exactly what what happens to the transformed heart, the the heart that's bent towards God, yeah. is, is you really do start to see the face of Christ in the world around us. And boy, that's that's something I, I sure like to strive for. Absolutely. And and it's 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 hard to do. I mean, we think about the gospel from this weekend, uh, and and the notion that the only way and this was this was my homily Um, But the only way that we can be the Samaritan, the only way that we can be Christ's minister, the only way we can reach out and and, uh, and bind and heal the wounds of of the people lying in the ditch is if we first realize that we're the guy in the ditch, Mm. you know? And and that is is really where Abraham found himself and so many others that God entered a covenant with. They weren't these high and mighty folks, but they were everyday folks, everyday people, who, who were yearning for uh, being known. You know, Abraham, in, in a real way, wished to be known. Uh, Adam and Eve were known perfectly by God until that sin, until the original sin. And then from that point, every soul was seeking to be known by, by God. And so when, when God reveals himself uh, in that voice to Abraham, um, he, he reveals himself as, as a God who wishes to be known and wishes to be in covenant with. And and that is still present today. And so, as you say, Chris, I think that whenever we, we look at uh, those great saints who really do look at another and they see immediately the face of Christ, um, it's it's one of those, I, I want to go to there. <laughs> you know, I, I want to be there. Um, and I know, Kathleen, that's a big part of, um, of the work that you do in terms of social justice and whatnot. It's really seeing the face of Christ first by just simply performing the work. And then the work in itself begins to build kind of a framework for for stepping out in faith, eh? Well, sure, yeah. I mean, like you know, with with the youth, with my kids, you know, we're always talking about I can you can do all the service work you want to do, yeah, and that's great. But if what's the purpose behind of why you do it? You know, mm-hmm. is it because we tell you to, or is it because you are wanting to serve the people of God? Like, are you spending time? You know, when we go to a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen. Are you spending time with the people that you're serving? Right. Or are you just throwing some stuff on a plate and saying, have a good day? Right. You know, and you've done the work, 
Um, but do you see Christ in those people? And that's always one of my questions whenever we go out and we do something. Where did you see Christ today? Mm-hmm. Did you even look for him? Was that even a, you know, or did he, sometimes he just pops up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, there right. it is. You know? Right, because just performing the work as work is Marxism. Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, performing the work of work just to do work. Um, In number 13 in this encyclical, uh, Pope Francis says, the opposite of faith is shown to be idolatry. And it's so easy for us in in our common, in in our society today, to just kind of work our way into idolatry in the same way that the, the Israelites got tired of waiting on God. They got tired of listening for his voice, and they got tired of the silence in between God speaking uh, the the re- the truth of his covenant to them that they's like well that's uh that's we got all these rings here because for some reason we all have earrings <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're gonna melt those down we're gonna make a big golden thing that uh, will become our civic god it will become it will become the god that we worship and we could, we can do that even with the notion of wanting to do, to reach out and to do something good for people we can become kind of these these well meaning folks that that don't have someone guiding the work that we do. And that's why faith is is called to be a light, huh? the the light of faith. Yeah. So I'm I'm still excited about this uh, this because I, I don't know about you, Chris, but I was waiting for the encyclical on faith because faith is one of those uh, ethereal words that we don't oftentimes really get a good concrete look at. Uh, that's exactly right. I I wanted to see where I mean because because Pope Benedict was so good at, at just laying teaching out there in, in a very profound way. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, that it is, faith is, is squishy. And, and how is Wibbly, the, wobbly, the timey, wimey. <laughs> of, of Pope Benedict going to kind of bring light to faith? Is that lemon, lemon fide? But how is he going to do it? And so far, it's, it's been really yeah, a, a really good read. A beautiful thing. Yeah, I, I like that. Faith is squishy. It seems that way. And so, how do you bring concrete to it? You know, how do you how do you cast it? And yes, I, I'm. Mm-hmm. I love the theme too that that comes out, and and really, I, I think to to your point about the Israelites, that faith is a response to God's faithfulness. Right. And and those who are coming out of out of Egypt, you know, maybe they'd forgotten what the mm-hmm. promises that were made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob or whatever. And we're looking, we're looking with the whole history of the Bible and the whole history of salvation, and we can respond to to God in a more faithful way, hopefully, because we have seen His faithfulness played out throughout all of salvation history, and certainly in the culmination of Christ. I know sometimes we we poke poke a little bit of fun at the Israelites, but but we have a a clearer view of yes, God's faithfulness. Absolutely, yeah. What they only um, heard and promise. We mm-hmm. actually experience in fulfillment and in sacrament. You know, what so, a huge gift! Yeah, what a huge gift and a huge responsibility, because we we know we know with a certainty of faith uh, that uh, that Christ is there and He requires something of us, and we don't have to kind of uh, listen to it for a disembodied voice. But He is there. He is there in His church, um, and I mean, myself included. I'm I'm the first in line for confession, but. Uh, uh, how many times do we turn away from that because we're looking for something more than what has been given? You know, uh, number number ten in uh, the Lumen Fide says faith understands that something so apparently ephemeral and fleeting as a word, when spoken by God, who is fidelity, becomes absolutely certain and unshakable, guaranteeing the continuity of our journey through history. God takes something so fleeting as a word, the Pope says. And he makes it something concrete. Mm. He takes the wibbly wobbly of faith, and by his word being a part of it, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, all of a sudden faith becomes realized. Because as our second reading in the gospel this weekend uh, tells us, is that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And so everything that was spoken in, in a sense almost in shadow, kind of in, in foreshadowing, is completely realized in Christ. And he is faith. The way, the truth, and the life, right? And and that's just, it, it's all coming into beautiful focus in this uh, in this document. So if you haven't read it, um, it's it's available on any number of uh, of sites. Um, Vatican.va, of course, is the the best one to go. In fact, if you go to the Vatican.va site, somebody's been playing around with JavaScript JavaScript because a little box pops up and says, "Hey, you're visiting here. We do you want to download this thing?" And you can you can actually download the PDF. Yeah. 
Um, now, of and, course, and the answer is yes because if you download it, you, you don't have to read it with that parchment background. That's that true. <laughs> yes, and oh, how the the only thing that could have been worse is if the title would have been in Comic Sans. Comic Sans, I knew yeah. that was coming. <laughs> yeah, somebody had to say it. Somebody had to. Now, of course, now that the, the encyclical is out, um, we turn to the uh, the dead horse desk. Um, one of the bloggers that that we we know from uh, from Catholicon and who is really big in the Catholic scene now, Brandon Vaught. Uh, he got a cease and desist order from the Vatican and from the USCCB for providing an ebook ready version of Lumen Fide right when it came out. So, oh. um, so he he got uh, he got the the tweet or the text that the the document was out, and uh, he went over to the website, and he found that of course it was on the parchment background, and uh, so he wanted to make an ebook format ready for himself so that he could read it, and he said, "Ah, oh, well, I'm a I'm a good Catholic. I'll just put this up for whoever wants it." And um, as soon as, um, as he did that, very, very shortly later, um, he was sent a cease, cease and desist letter from the USCCB and the Vatican. And he since launched a, um, a hashtag, Free the Word, and he has a very long manifesto on, on his website of, um, of kind of the, the problem and then what, he can, what we can do about it and what we should be able to do about it. And we talk about this all the time. Because uh, we know that some of the texts are uh, kind of being, it seems like they're being hoarded uh, so that we, we don't have any um, uh, access to them or not greater access to them. And so we thought we'd talk a little bit about it without trying to kind of uh, beat the dead horse as it is. Um, but uh, one of the things that was brought to my attention is that in U.S. copyright law, one has the obligation to defend their copyright. And Brandon actually notes this. Um, and, and so my question is, how can this be done, but at the same time allow for a greater reach of biblical and church texts? Because right now, if, if you want to uh, provide for um, an encyclical or even w- the, the texts of Scripture, you have to have distinct permission to be able to share it as a whole, um, or I believe even parts of, uh, of some of these texts. Like if you wanted to do like an entire chapter of Matthew on your website, you wouldn't mm-hmm. be able to because the USCCB is in control of that copyright. Is that right? Yeah. I and, thought that was public domain. Well, it's not, and, and wow. that's the thing. And, and the reason that the Church gives for, uh, for protecting this copyright is so that the words of Scripture aren't, uh, aren't changed or altered, because okay. if it were public domain, anybody could just kind of take it, who knows what they could have do- done with Lumen Fide and then released it. Sure. And so they were kind of on their guard um, uh, against uh, Brandon doing this, uh, you know, releasing this, uh, this PDF. Um, and so he's trying to suggest kind of a median way. And I don't know what you think about this, Chris, but uh, the, the, the Creative Commons license is what he suggests. So a Creative Commons attribution, no derivatives license is what he suggests. I, I, I like the idea. I, at I, first, I get, when, when Brandon put up that he'd gotten a cease and desist from the USCCB, I, I was angry. I was frustrated. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I, but I do understand. I do understand wanting pr- to protect the work itself. I guess the line that, that got me was, you know, you're you're taking money or, or stealing from the Pope by doing this in some way. And I thought that was just really, that was an improper response, in, in yeah. my view, my very limited view. And and I think that that's true. Um, Brandon quotes from, from his website the, the actual things that were that were said. Uh, and, I, yeah, it, it wasn't the, the most uh, pastoral would be the, the word that uh-huh. I would choose, you know. Um, we have to, we don't want to, to, to bruise a, a bent reed here, you know. Luckily, I think Brian, ha- or not Brian, um, uh, Brandon has a, a, a good constitution, you know, so. Uh, but, but yeah, some of, the, some of the language was a little, a little uh, pointed. Yeah, it it's a good thing, and, and I really applaud Brandon for the way that he responded to the situation, because he didn't, he didn't get angry. Right. He didn't. I, I I could tell that he was hurt, or at yeah. least it, it came across that that he was hurt that that the USCCB and the Vatican would respond that way. Right. But to actually to actually make a reasoned argument uh, yeah. for the Creative Commons license. Yes. And and just lay it all out there. And I know he brought in canon law and 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 of course civil law as well. Yeah. I thought it, it, that was a that was a very measured response by and a a lesser man could have had. A very different response. That's right. It could have been a flame war with actual flame, Mm. you know. Uh, (laughs) And so uh, Brandon is is really wanting to to provide a solution that protects the integrity of those important texts, 
as he says, but also to free them to be shared and consumed by more people throughout the world. And for, from his perspective, the Creative Commons license can do that. And one of the things that, that the points that he makes that I find very interesting, he says that, um, that the reason that Wikipedia searches are number one in all the search results when you type anything in, the first thing that comes up is Wikipedia, is because it's under a Creative Commons license and there are people that are kind of trading this information all day long. Mm. And so I wonder what that would look like if you typed in um, really any anything because the church is so wide in its scope. Can you imagine the search results from the Vatican website overtaking even Wikipedia if uh, if we had an opportunity to for creative comms or something like that where where just people were constantly sharing this information back and forth. Th- to me, that would be awesome. Imagine all the work you'd get done, Kathleen, uh, <laughs> with, with, uh, with your students. Yeah, well, actually, my students aren't allowed to use Wikipedia. <laughs> Well, exactly. But imagine if uh, if they could Google, yeah, and the the stuff that would come up would be from from official church sources. But because it's got a Creative Commons license on it, it's it's kind of being more freely shared back and forth. Yeah, I think that would be excellent. I mean, yeah, they would. They, I'm I'm constantly talking to my students about use good sources because they come back. I mean, you tell them to research, you know, John Paul II. They come back with some crazy stuff that's right like, it never happened that's he, where here's a blog from a person who talked about <laughs> yeah. who wrote about who got this source yeah. from this source who originally went back to the original and, source. Yeah. and they will swear by it they're like uh-huh. you know no it's happened i'm like <laughs> okay no, I, I don't think the pope ever went to mars no yeah no not not in not in body maybe he bilocated there maybe can you bilocate somewhere without an atmosphere Ooh, that is the question of our day, isn't it? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I think everything boils down to that, <laughs> to that question of existence. I would think that you could. You know who we need to run this whole concept by is the Pontifical Office of Search Engine Optimization. Yes, you know, now, now you see <laughs> that is exactly what I think we need. In fact, that's, that's, my, um, that's my answer, is that we need an equivalent at the USCCB or the Vatican um, that thinks outside the search engine box. Um, so I agree. Yeah, reforms shouldn't just be in the liturgy and civil law, but reform should also be taking place in how we're using technology. Because exactly, it is, I mean, I'm going to sound like a fogey here, but uh, the Vatican documents shouldn't just stay in a book <laughs> on a shelf somewhere. We've actually got to take them and make them all digital, which they are. But to to really look at how to to do that with search engine optimization with um, indexing systems with sharing and, and kind of having that, that Facebook Twitter mentality, you know, um, by the way, I'm not looking for a job though. So, uh, it, it bothers me pretty tremendously when I'm looking for some kind of Catholic resource and I, and, and what pops up are some sites that I think are, are pretty well non-faithful to the yeah. church. Yeah. And, and I really would love anything that, that puts the, the truth and beauty of the church up a little higher in the search uh, results. Yeah, yeah really. that that would be nice. I would like that too. Yeah, yeah, novel concept. It's true. So, Brandon Vaught, um, we salute you, sir, and um, I, I appreciate the, the, a very well reasoned argument. So, hopefully, uh, hopefully, there are some that are listening and are ready to chime in with really constructive stuff too. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we we moved from uh, from the teacher teaching the students, like Kathleen does. Yes, um, to the student becoming the teacher, a 28-year-old Rachel, who is a blogger, who has a blog entitled Catholic with a Vengeance. I believe Jeff Blackwell should actually say that. Jeff, could you say that for us? I'll try. <laughs> Catholic with a Vengeance. See, <laughs> she, she penned this post as an open letter kind of to pastors, youth pastors, as she says, music directors, deacons, and catechists. It was, uh, it was actually from, I believe, 2012. But uh, it's been making the rounds on social media, so we thought we'd talk a little bit about it in the time that we have remaining. Um, it, the, the blog post is, What Young Catholics Truly Want. And uh, this 28-year-old, she just went through the RCIA, so she's a brand new Catholic as of around November, I guess, of last year. And she says, quote, Frequently young Catholics feel ignored. Not that they aren't being pampered or praised or given special attention. I mean, they're trying to tell you exactly what they like, what they expect from the church, what they are yearning for deep in their souls, but you simply aren't listening. And um, she said that she was on fire in the RCIA. She had a really good class. They did their homework. They were fully immersed in the work of learning about their faith. Um, they they uh, learned prayers in Latin and in English. It sounds like whatever parish she was in, 
um, was really well rounded in their celebration of the liturgy. She said there were a lot of smells and bells and things like that. There, there was incense. There were there were Latin hymns. Uh, and then after she became a Catholic, she moved to a parish, as she says, quote, with bare walls, hurried masses, and bare bones hymns, unquote. Mm. Um, she said that she joined the choir and she attempted to ask about doing some Latin hymnody, and it didn't really, didn't really compute. Um, she also said, quote, I suggested to our priest once, I think a Eucharistic procession around Christmas to celebrate the Incarnation would be cool. Deaf ears in reply. I was told by the music director, we don't do that anymore. Silence bores the congregation. And by the priest, a procession would be inconvenient, unquote. Um, yeah, she says, what I gave was the opinion of a young Catholic, a real live young Catholic, and they didn't want it. And so that, I, I don't know um, about what your experiences are, because really we're all young Catholics, at least for the moment. And Jeff, you can be one too. Because mm-hmm. you're really a new Catholic. Yeah, only, 20 years old or something. Only so. about 20 years old. Yeah. So that makes you a young Catholic. Um, and she posits the problem with all the pastors, youth pastors, music directors, etc. Uh, keep telling us young folk what bores us, what we really like, and what we find interesting. So he's, she says they're wrong. If one listens to a young Catholic voice, one would find that we're yearning for beauty, for tradition, and truth. Traditional Catholicism honestly fascinates us. Do you think there's any resonance here, Kathleen, um, you know, for that um, wider experience of faith? or Yeah, I, there are a few a few issues I have with, uh, first off, I think that she, she is right. There are young Catholics who are looking for um, tradition and, and that move back to, I mean, traditional Catholicism, traditional masses, um, Latin. Yeah, you know. the, a shift from mass as entertainment to mass as worship sure. of God. Sure, and I th- but the idea is you have to be patient. It's not going to happen in one day. And, and especially with her being a new Catholic, um, I, I think she has to tread lightly because there are a lot of young adults out there who, um, who are not where you are, uh, where we are. I mean, because I'm there with you. I, if, mm-hmm. we, if we did more traditional things in mass, I would, I don't know. I, I wouldn't go more than I go now because I go very often. Yeah. But, um, you know, I would love it. Um, but there are a vast majority of young Catholics who just don't understand. They don't understand that. They don't have the education. They're not theologians. They, didn't they, go- they don't know what they don't know, perhaps. Right. And so they're going to mass because, you know, because they know that it's something they, they need to do. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them are not going to mass because they don't believe that it's something they need to do. Right. Um, but, you know, you have to reach young adults where they are. Sure. Um, and I believe that really it's a, it's a, an issue of not being educated throughout the church. It's not just a young Catholics, you know, mm-hmm. point of view. There, when you talk to the average Catholic, they don't know why we say mass in Latin or we don't say right. mass in Latin anymore. Or if they ever did say mass in Latin, you know, some <laughs> right. people are like, I don't know what that we even did that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so there has to be um, with this return to tradition and to the beauties of, of what that brings, yeah. there has to be education that goes along with it. Absolutely. You know, and it sounds like she got that in her RCIA class. You yeah. Know? And so, so it's yeah. kind of like the kid who, you know, well, I mean, you know, she, she, she has experienced the beauty of it mm-hmm. and the greatness of it. And she wants to share that. And I think that that's beautiful. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I, I found an experience that you have to tread very lightly, um, especially with, with young adults and, and, you know, because if, if tomorrow we woke up and all we, we said was Mass and Latin and there were uh, Gregorian chant, and mm-hmm. um, like I said, I'd be there with you. But, um, you know, it's just not something that you can turn on and, and young adults, young Catholics be like, oh, heck yeah, this is what, you know, I'm mm-hmm. longing for in my all right, heart. Well, you, you have to be exposed to something. Sure. It's, it's kind of like uh, whenever you hear um, a, new, a new song on the radio that kind of gets inside you. you know? Right. Uh, you, you're exposed to it. And then you kind of uh, deepen your experience of it because if you're like me and you hear a new song that you like, I just listen to it over and over. So I can't stand it anymore. Yeah, I think possibly. I, I, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. I, I was going to say I think I think possibly what it, what it might also be is is um, not so much that it's just getting used to um, a strange, new, beautiful method. I think that what she's also pinpointing is a, a dryness within the church itself and a sure. sort of. Um, mm listlessness i mean uh, for instance the priest himself you know that a procession is inconvenient that we're forgetting what we're actively taking part in within the mass um, sure. i think if we brought our um, our young people into the realization of what this means it doesn't even necessarily have to be 
through the Latin Mass, as much as I love it and as beautiful sure. as I think it is, I, I, what we need to bring hard is the reality of the, the foundational Eucharistic presence. And, yeah. and that's what I think that, uh, that Orthodoxy truly is. And all, all roads will lead back to Orthodoxy. Um, I mean, it will lead to the Latin Mass. It will lead to different methods. So, so just, long as we have that, you mean orthodoxy in its purest sense, its which purest is sense. which is right worship, huh? right? Right. Yeah. Uh huh. Chris, you were going to say? Yeah, I, I'm coming at this in a, an entirely different way, uh -huh. a little bit. Well, can you come at something a little bit in an entirely different way? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I think, I think all here is is a good one. Yeah. I, I like this because I think we need. Church, I think we need the Mass to be distinctly different, mm -hmm. yeah. set apart from anything else that people experience. I think, I, I totally see the point that people kind of need to be eased into it, yeah. but sometimes I wonder if people miss the holiness of the Mass yeah. and the holiness of the presence of the Eucharist, because some of the things we do at Mass looks like a pale imitation of the entertainment that the world is offering us, yeah. and when it's not very good, then you go, well, this is just lame. Yeah. Yeah, and, if, and if it were higher, if it were holier, if it were dis more distinctly set apart from, from everything else we experience in life, yeah. if the weight of that worship experience and the weight of the presence of that Eucharist may be more profoundly impactful back to folks. Hmm. I, I, and, and I think that you're kind of on the, on the nose there, and she suggests that, is really, and we talk about this quite a bit, Mass has to be something else. Mm. It's got to be something different. Right. If it isn't, it's, it's basically our poor attempt to, um, to, to create some form of entertainment. And we don't have the sound systems for it. We don't right. have the, the, the band for it, you know, and, and we don't have necessarily the dynamic speakers for it, you well, know. And, Father, I was, I was a Protestant minister for, for six years, and I know how much we, we thought about, you know, kind of the, the answer to the question, what did I get out of today's service? Was yeah. I, enter, you know, kind of what was I entertained? Did the pastor speak to me? And I guess one of the one of the wonderful things about coming back into Catholicism is to realize that when I go into worship, it's not about what I get out of it. Yeah, it's it's what I give back to God and and how I how I turn my gaze back to the presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, I think I think possibly and 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 really, Pope Benedict taught me this in in so many ways. Is he elevated the church? He brought back a lot of the traditions that were that had got into disuse and he, mm -hmm. he raised them up to show the majesty of the church and the difference of the church. And I think really reflected the holiness, the majesty of God yeah. and, and the way that that comes through in the church. I totally understand. What, maybe we, we want a measured res response here, but, mm -hmm. but there's, there's inherent value to, to yeah. letting the mass fully reflect the majesty and glory of God. That's correct. Uh, I mean, overnight, um, I essentially changed the vestments that, that were being worn to the ones that I wear. And, uh, and just that, you know, moving from kind of this, uh, I guess you could say, a, a, a suggestion of a vestment to, um, to a vestment that, that is in keeping with what a lot of my parishioners remember from their childhood. And that began some of the most important conversations on what the liturgy should be. And uh, mm -hmm. we actually began to change some of our altar furnishings and, uh, and appointments and things like that, uh, just the, the fabric on top of them. And it, it has created a deeper desire for other, you know. We're, we're not using stuff that you can buy at Walmart mm -hmm. to, uh, to adorn our parish church, but rather we're, we're making things with, with fine linens, to show that it is that it is other, and it's amazing how just a change of quote environment like that unquote um, mm -hmm. it can really it can begin a dialogue and it can even speed it along faster than we think, you know. So that's that's it's encouraging, uh, and so we'll we'll put a link to uh, to this blogger's article. We didn't have a whole lot of time to to uh, to discuss what her solutions are, but if you want to look at the solutions, we'll put that in the show notes. And of course, because time is fleeting. Uh, we're going to head straight into the CU Pick of the Week. All righty, and for our first Pick of the Week, let's go over to Kathleen. Okay. Yeah. Well, my Pick yeah. of the Week, yesterday I took my dad um, to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Um, now, now, I know we have listeners from all over, but um, for those who are local and for those who are not, this is awesome. Uh, awesome. And, you know, I, my dad is a huge history buff, and, and 
Um, you know, so we knew we had to get there early. Early for you. That's because, great. Because okay. we would we would spend the whole day, you know, and he read yeah. everything. Um, and <laughs> uh, but it was, you know, I went a couple years ago, well, several years ago as a student, and it was just one building, and now it's like three or four. Oh yeah. And they have the new uh, what's called Beyond All Boundaries, the 4D experience, mm-hmm. narrated by Tom Hanks. <laughs> um, and it was really great. We did. I mean, we did everything. We did the submarine thing. We blew stuff up. Dad, you know, was in charge yeah. of the torpedoes. And so every time they were like, you know, shoot the torpedo, dad got very excited about it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's a very cool place. They have, uh, it's run by a lot of volunteers, a lot of uh, men and women who were in World War II. Um, super, super nice. Just want to tell you about their experience, about what was going on. Um, the exhibits themselves are phenomenal. Um, whether you like history or you don't, um, it's very, very interesting, very um, very cool. I liked it a lot. Um, and so that's the National World War II Museum in New, New Orleans. It's, and it's it actually, if you if you live somewhere like Austin, a little weekender trip too. Yeah, and it'll that take. Sounds like a nice one. Yeah, and it'll take you all day. We got there about ten, and we left about four, and it closes at five. That's right. So. You may have to put your kids <laughs> into cryostasis though. Although yeah. there's stuff for kids at the World War II there Museum. There is. Yeah. There is. You know, and, it, and it's easy to walk through. There's a lot of you know. Sometimes museums are just, you know. Mm boring but yeah. there was a lot you know for someone who's a visual dad likes to read everything i like to see things yeah and so it worked for both of us i loved it very cool well we're gonna speed through our, our picks of the week i didn't chris i didn't ask you if you had one for the show but do you got one you guys go ahead i'm, I'm actually i'm noodling oh it's it's, 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 <laughs> it's it's kind of like uh it's kind of like whenever you're ordering at a restaurant we'll, we'll just That's come right. back to you yeah so jeff Thanks. mine has no significance other than just fun uh uh, this is an app that my eight-year-old grandson found, and um, it's, it's, it's from the folks at uh, Bad Robot Interactive. Oh, yeah. Action Movie FX. Um, <laughs> but I'm so 2011 because this, this was the app of the year in 2012. <laughs> I'm just fine. But they out keep updating it. it. Yeah, they do. And, and it's got a lot of uh, Star Trek stuff on there, and just it, it's it's hilarious. It's fun. <gasps> to they play. do. I haven't updated oh, mine. Yeah. It's got yeah. the transporter. The transporter. On it? Okay. It's really cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm uh, I'm yeah. sold. My, so, my son is still stuck on the blowing up stuff like his sisters, but <laughs> oh right. Well, I keep trying to be like transport them. Don't blow them up. <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah. That's right. Send them somewhere else. Falling from the sky. I mean, there's so so much fun stuff in that uh, these. Uh, Little snippets. So um, yeah. Anyway, check it out. Mary Kate, you got one? Um, I do. I actually um, have just been really um, meditating on the prayers of Saint Bridget lately. Uh-huh. Um, I just I really love them. They're a beautiful meditation on our Lord, and it really connects with your faith and seeing through the eyes of Christ, as we've been discussing. Um, so. Very cool. All right, and then of course, uh, my pick of the week is uh, the Mission Log podcast from the folks at Nerdist, um, and uh, they have they are doing a podcast on each one of the Star Trek, the original series episodes. They go through a synopsis of the episode. They discuss uh, what the episode's about from their point of view. They talk about the ethical and moral situations going on. Hmm. And then they talk about how the show the show holds up today. And they're doing this for each one of the episodes. And so it's, they're hmm. about an hour long. So uh, for me, that's like a, a jog, you know? This is nice. This yeah. is very exciting. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> do you Mary have your Kate. Star Trek shirt ready? <laughs> I, I do, I do. It's uh, It may or may not be under my cleric tonight uh, so, <laughs> it is it is a uh what, what do we call those things uh, uh, a level 12 geek alert yeah, yeah. yeah. all right uh and let's see and wow. chris have you got it there okay I, i'm ready to weigh in I've, I've given it a lot of thought <laughs> i was on vacation over the july 4th week and and naturally as you do when you're on vacation i decided to take up a new mu- musical instrument really I the ukulele oh oh yeah i love it yeah, naturally. I mean, of course, everybody loves the ukulele. It seems like That's everybody not. ends up at a ukulele at some point mm-hmm. or another. They do. So I was having I was having breakfast with some friends the other day, and I was telling them about this. And after they, you know, made their ukulele jokes right. and whatnot, <laughs> I got a link after the fact to this incredible video of a young man from, I believe he's in Japan, playing all of the Mario Brothers music <laughs> on the ukulele. Oh. And I got to tell you... It makes the ukulele look pretty sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm glad you continued the nerd alert. That's right. Exactly. That's that's a that's a pretty significant nerd alert because I'm thinking, oh well, it's a guy in Japan, so maybe he's playing, you know, some uh, 
some Japanese, uh, you know, uh, not at all ancient no. song. No, he's he's playing one of the most important exports from Japan ever. <laughs> In my opinion, his name is Sunga Young, S U N G H A J U N G, and uh, if you just search for for Mario Brothers music on ukulele, you'll find it. Of course, I've got so, the link there as well. So, so is it your hope that um, that other people like yourself are going to learn to play on the ukulele, the Super Mario Brothers theme? I will tell you that this is now my the height of my ukulele aspiration. <laughs> so none of the Final I can Fantasy nothing music. Better. Not and once you see it, you'll understand. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, Time now how's that for a plug? That's quite a tease, if if yeah. I do say so myself. Yeah, Jeff, did you ever learn to play a musical instrument? Actually, uh, I, the ukulele is the first instrument I learned to play. Really? Back in the seventh grade, and um, from there I graduated to guitar. And then I taught my younger brother to play, and he just took off. He's a, a lead guitar picker and pedal steel guitarist. Oh, and so, wow. Yeah, but a ukulele is a lot easier to carry to a gig. Mm-hmm. That's true. Than a pedal <laughs> steel. That's the thing. I've, I've kind of dabbled in guitar for a number of years, so I just I picked up the ukulele, and I have so much more fun playing it for some reason. It I is. I don't know it's, why. It, it is a fun instrument to play. I, huh. I have one myself. You have a ukulele? That's right. Yeah. Kathleen is also a guitarist. Yeah, but I don't, I don't play it so well because I have... I have chubby little fingers, <laughs> so they don't work so well. But um, yeah, I might pick it up. Now, look, you've inspired me. I might pick it up again. And See? Did you play See, Mario? Well, I, no, I didn't. You're... I didn't play Mario. Well, you yeah. also want to do Mario, no doubt. Yeah, well, it's it's catchy. Hey, Chris, I saw you had a link uh, in the show notes here, and and how do we get the show notes, Father? Oh, that's a very good question, Jeff. If you go to CatholicUnderground dot com, you can click on the latest episode, and when you click on the latest episode, you'll get a link to the video that you can watch on YouTube. You'll get a link to the audio, which you can listen to with your ears, and you'll also get the show notes, which are everything that we talked about. So that's at CatholicUnderground dot com. Um, and that's the, the best way to get the show notes and to interact, by the way. Um, and now we move to Jeff to, to tell us where some of our help comes from. Yeah, portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. That's audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. That is correct. And so for the show notes that accompany this episode and the podcast, if you want to find out more about our apostolate, if you want to find out ways to connect with us on the Twitter or the Facebook, you can head over to catholicunderground.com. There are big friendly buttons waiting there to help you out, as well as watch live and listen live so that you can interact with us whenever we do have a live show. And uh, we want to, of course, uh, let everybody know who we are because... You know, we're here. Jeff Blackwell, who is the tech director for the CU, he's the chief knob, chief knob tweaker, and boy, was he tonight at the Blackwell Communications Group. He's at VO underscore guy. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure. Kathleen Lee, the faith ninja, at Kathleen Y-A-B-R on Twitter. Thank you, Kathleen. Good night, dear friends. That's right. Uh, Chris Williston. Ah, we've got a line item in here. Chris Williston, at C. Williston. Is that V-I? It is. Very good. You're a V-I? Indeed. Just like Star Trek. Uh, Thanks, Chris, for joining us. Thank you. And Mary-Kate Taylor is an evangelist and part-time coin engraver (laughs) for the Catholic Underground. Thank you, (laughs) Mary-Kate. Thank you all. You know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. You can join us on the interwebs at catholicunderground.tv for even more with the See You Later. We want to thank you for tuning in and hanging out with us here on the digital continent. We are Catholic Underground, and we are Faith Gone Digital. We will see you next time. From the Catholic Underground. Alrighty, folks, welcome to the See You Later, which is the show after the show, which is also a show. Uh, I'm Father Chris. We've got another Chris, Chris Williston. Hi there. A very happy memory, because he's not dead yet. He's still here. Uh, and got Kathleen Lee. I'm feeling better. <laughs> so I go better. Mary Kay Taylor, who, by the way, <laughs> from what I can see, I've had to, my eyeballs are, you know, all over the place during the show. Um, but Mary Kate's been switching video for us and looks pretty good to me. Yeah, I've been trying to. I've probably given some people some stomach aches, dizzy. Make- <laughs> That's okay, actually. You're helping with, with the kinetic work of video, because uh, it's a challenge to try and... Um, the, the 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 trick is to anticipate who's going to speak next. Right. Yep. right. 
Right. And I think you, from what I could see, you were doing really well with that. So Kudos. YouTube, YouTube will tell. It's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, Jeff Blackwell over there. Uh, how you feeling, Jeff? Like a million bucks after taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Oh, Jeff's got so many isms. Yeah. He has great isms. Blackwell isms. Yeah. I like him a lot. You know, we actually didn't get even halfway through, maybe halfway through our show notes uh, tonight. I know. Because I know. We got all caught on the potpourri. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, I think that was okay. listen, guys. Chatty. Well, and, but you know, Chris, you, you and Jason both, <laughs> if I may uh, wax and wane in your favor for a moment, um, you, you're obviously you've been podcasting for at least 100 episodes. <laughs> Because you, you've got a really good ability to anticipate what's going to be said, and you just kind of take it and run with it. Yeah. And that is not always a given when you have somebody on a podcast. I'm just saying. Well, thank, thank you, Father. No. Appreciate that. No, it's true. And a doff of the cap to you as well. <laughs> That's right. I believe protocol allows me a slight tip of the hat to you. Um, let's see. So, uh, it, let's see. Where can we pick up here? Um, maybe we can just finish quickly that discussion on um, on the, the, the young lady with um, Catholic with a Vengeance. Mm-hmm. The suggestions that her recommendation... What's that? No, go ahead. Uh, her recommendations... Um, and it's funny because when she writes, she writes with a little bit of an edge. Mm-hmm. And uh, just looking at her pick online, she seems like to be rocking the edginess. You know? Well, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I, I was like, Catholic with a Vengeance. Like, mm. And then I looked up what Vengeance means. And it's mm-hmm. like, it implies like the, that you're like getting revenge in some violent way <laughs> against someone who has hurt you. Yeah. And so, you know, I just wanted to be like, okay, easy tiger. You know, that, <laughs> that was kind of my whole, uh, you know, I'm reading her thing. I think she, her, her blog, excellent points. And I'm someone who is, you know, I'm right there with you. Um, you know, but I, I just wanted to be like, Oh, whoa, whoa. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Vengeance is a strong word. Right. Which implying that there's been some hurt, you know, in and your, there may have been, it may, maybe, maybe perhaps. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I have to say, I, I really didn't take it so much as, a, um, I guess, a, so literally as revenge. I think I took it sort of as, a, you know, I think it's great to have a Catholic identity because I think that's what we're lacking in today's society. And I think that's yeah. what she's getting at. That's kind of that what I hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Catholic yeah. Identity. And, and I, I think, uh, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but young Catholics tend to be incredibly passionate. We, we are. We, <laughs> we are. are passionate uh, people. I'll just go and throw mine into the category. I, you know, you guys have this intellectual discussion about it all i keep thinking about is die hard with a vengeance yeah. mm. <laughs> that's right catholicism <laughs> that's the sequel right. and the coliseum was die hard yeah. Yeah. yeah i just i just don't want her to be um to feel the temptation is to become reactive mm-hmm. right whenever and, and angry yeah right you know I, and, and for someone who has been in in the you know i'm 27 um and i've been in this Thank you. Um, and I've been in this movement, you know, a little bit. And she talks about being part of the John Paul II generation and all this. And, and you know, I there have been times in my life where I've been like, especially after I got my degree in theology, like, why are we doing this? Boom. Like, why do the churches look like, you know, do you? And, and are we not having, you know, like, why, why, why? And, you know, you want to go up to your nearest priest or bishop and just, just push them around Shake and say, them. let's go. Hey. Hey, you. you. Know. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I don't want her to feel um, disheartened. Yeah. Yeah, and I want her to know that, like, it took me a long time to feel that there is this this movement, mm-hmm. this movement back to everything that she desires and that she wants. Um, it's it's more of a it, it's a swell. I think you know. Yeah. Uh, that, that rather than rather than um, a bomb, it seems like what's right. happening is a swell. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is the way things tend to work in the church. Mm-hmm. Um. Things that are of of the spirit, right. they tend to work in in swells, kind of like um, kind of like waves washing in on shore. Some mm-hmm. of the waves uh, are are immediate, and they you know they create the little impression in the sand. But but the waves that have the most impact from the tide are the ones that build for right. for a long time, and then they crash ashore, and there's no stopping them. You know, Ooh. a little wave you can right. stop with with your thigh. Right, and if I can, if I'm surfing that wave, like if I am riding that wave, if I've rode it for a long time, I can I can surf it. But if not, like if you just hit me with that wave, you, you, you're, I'm I'm drowning. And that's mm-hmm. what I think. You know, a lot of young people, there has to be that. Hey, come on now, come on. Yeah. You know, this is why we're doing what we do. This is what we teach. You know, um, let come on, you get on the wave too. 
But we are generationally impatient. Yes, yes that's true. Uh, incredibly so. Mm-hmm. And we want change to happen overnight, especially when we are adamantly passionate sure. that we are right. And I, and I believe that we are calling the church back to, to something that is good and, and right. Mm-hmm. And so we want it to happen tomorrow, because right. and, and we're frustrated when it doesn't. Yeah. So I, I think her voice reflects that. Sure. That's right. Yeah. And, and so some of the suggestions she makes, uh, number one, we wouldn't mind if you listened. Stop telling us what we think and we like. And that, that sounds like our generation very well. It sounds like the younger generation mm-hmm. um, just longing to be heard. In fact, I actually, because I'm trying to, we're trying to reboot youth ministry in my parishes, mm-hmm. um, I found myself being the old guy, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. actually, because I was in youth ministry as a youth minister, and I had a couple of my young people trying to, to tell me what they wanted, and I had to stop myself from saying, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and it was almost an out-of-body experience going, oh, yep. I've become my father. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and, and I said, well, guys, that may very well work, but it, it's going to be a challenge. Because I, we, some of us do come from a little bit of experience. And while I won't completely you know, dash what your dreams are for youth ministry, I will say that you're going to have a challenge. In this case, it was um, they want to start a program that requires a lot of adults to, um, to, to basically help to, to support the, the, the youth ministry. How that'll ever work. Uh, right. And well, but that's the thing is, like I told them, I said, well, the median age in the two parishes that we're trying to reboot ministry is, is probably about 65 or 75. Wow. Okay. And I said, the people that, that, are, are constant givers, you know, that, that in stewardship of ministry, stewardship of finance, stewardship yeah. of, well, probably more than, than prayer. But uh, I said, th- those folks, they're the ones who are 75, who've been coming to Mass and who have been invested in this parish since practically it was incepted. Yeah. And they're going to be there for you, but they're not going to be able to do all of the things that you need uh, a, a younger person to do uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of youth ministry support. But I did. I had to stop myself and go, okay, now, how can I encourage what they want and listen to them, but at the same time say, well, this is going to be a challenge, yeah. you know? And I'm not sure that our younger generation understands that completely, is that, yeah, there are challenges, um, but but uh, younger generations don't necessarily tend to see challenges as challenges. Mm-mm. I don't I don't know. I, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm getting older now. Yeah, you are kind of old. 32. God. Who knows what these kids think these days? These kids with their rock music and their, I think it's very their interesting. clogs. And I think it's very interesting, you know, that when we start to separate the church into age groups. Yeah. Um, because each, you know, I've worked with, with youth ministry. I've worked with young adult ministry. Um, and, and, you know, young adults and, and you say, this is what we want. And then old people say, well, older people say, well, mm-hmm. this is what we want, you know, and, and it's like, okay, well, what's best for the church? Let's find a way to fit everyone in. Like, we are not a church that caters to, to one group or another over another, you know. Um, and so that's what's so frustrating about doing ministry is, is, you know, well, what do you want? Okay, well, how can how does the church address that already? How how can you fit into the church? You know, like it's just, you know, you, see what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think it's a good point because I often find that there's too much of a division in parishes we have the children's mass we have the teenage mass i never had that mentality growing up mm-hmm. i always just it was very fluid entrance into community yeah you, have to, you just have to be very careful that you know this is not what she's saying at all but you know when you start talking about this is the blank mass well okay mm-hmm. but but is it is it a mass for everyone which is what mass is meant to be well, that's like I always say, I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with qualifiers in front of Mass unless yeah. it is holy sacrifice of the... Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. but that, that's just me. Um, let's see. What, what else does she, she suggest as we, as we uh, go down? Um, she's, she wants good hymns. We hate bare hymns and Masses that must be kept under 45 minutes. We want the red meat that is a 2,000-year-old Catholic faith. And not only that, we want to seek our teeth into it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I have to understand something of her passion. I mean, the, yeah. the, this group of the church has been kind of sort of stigmatized to some extent for a long time by mm. certain people. I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at a lot of the way well, that... I noticed that. I mean, and, and having one parish that uh, is an African-American parish, and we, we have um, a gospel choir. And uh, one of the things that, that I notice 
is that there's a very actually a very small number of people other than the choir who actually are singing. Right, exactly. Mm. Right. You know, the the young people and you're thinking, "Oh, well, it's 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 upbeat music." It's, uh, there, there are drums and things like that. Surely the young people must be engaging. When I look on their faces, some of them, I'm, they're not singing. And, and the expression is kind of like, uh, yeah, it definitely is this maybe lame, you know? <laughs> and so it just goes to show that, that even something as, as upbeat as what, uh, what might, one might interpret as gospel music uh, is not necessarily engaging in the sense of being able to enter into worship for everybody. And within the history of our church, there there is hymnody that even if you're not singing it, it allows you to enter into worship. And I think that it teaches you, it educates you yeah. as well, to what's sure. happening. Well, sure. Hymnody and, should educate, right? right? That's it's that's That's why uh, hymnody in English or in the vernacular was introduced, is they, in a sense, became catechetical lessons that taught you about God, even if you couldn't understand the depth of the theology taking place within the Mass celebrated in a different language. Yeah. And, and so what are we doing now whenever we aren't in, in, in the so-called hymnody, uh, or just really, they're not hymns, they're songs, um, whenever we're, we're expressing incompletely, incorrectly, or not at all theological concepts. I mean, that's what hymns are supposed to be. They're not supposed to make us feel good. I mean, I love a good chord progression that just sinks right deep into my spine and almost evokes a tear. I love that. But I don't expect it at Mass to say that I've gone to Mass. Right. You know, and I think far too often, though, what happens, and I'm guilty of this, is if I find that there's something not interesting or holding my attention, mm-hmm. you know, the old iPhone, you pick oh, it yeah. up and you find something to yeah. do. Well, that's what we do and, um, today. Yeah. Uh, right. Whereas... I think what you said about proper, um, I'm not going to use the right word here, but like the linens oh, yeah. and, and, and everything to set mass up as something that is holy yeah. and we're here for this time for this purpose. Mm-hmm. And yeah. as you say, Jeff, uh, you, you stumbled upon the right word because holy comes from, is come from Hebrew word, Kadesh, is mean to <laughs> set apart. And that's what holiness is. Huh? Whenever, whenever we're trying to give the sense of, of holiness, and I never knew that. that that's yeah, uh, that's we're incredible. we're setting something apart. So, like whenever a priest blesses something, he's making it, he's sanctifying it, yeah. the object. He's setting it apart for sacred use, and it's the same thing with us. As we become holier, and we understand that we become holy by means of the grace that is given to us. Huh? The the, the more in the state of grace that we are, the holier we become, the more set apart we become from the world and for Christ. In the world, but not of it. And that's exactly what that means, yeah. is, is we become set apart in the world, but because we, we belong to Christ more and more and more, the holier we become, the more we identify with him and the more we identify in him, yeah. through him all things came to be so that in all things he might be preeminent, the more we don't, I mean, the more we just want the things of God, the more we don't want all the other stuff. And yeah. we, under, we, begin to, we begin to experience that set apart, and we should experience that in the worship that we provide to God. We should experience in everything that the Mass is something that is set apart from the world. Oh, anyway. I guess Reach I'm, on. Hmm. Love it. Brother, Father. <laughs> end, <laughs> end of sermon. Um, but of Amen. course, the, the, <laughs> that's right. Let us pray. Uh, <laughs> but the challenge is how do you how do you do that? How do you do that? Uh, I, and I think Chris might be onto something. You just start doing it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that there's. I okay. I, I'm not going to say I I I know what the right way to go is. I just go a, a, a casual progression towards holiness. Mm-hmm. Just doesn't jive in my mind. With that's with that's. That that's a solution. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, uh, and I, I don't think you can have a casual progression towards holiness. Uh, hope. I mean, I realize that we we are all on a journey towards holiness. Sure. We each of us as individuals, and yes, certainly I make steps forward, backward towards holiness. Hopefully, all all the time, more forward than backward. Yeah. But that's me as an individual, and and what I want the church to be is is the height of holiness, uh, the place I enter into, where I experience it. Mm-hmm. Whole, holy W H mm-hmm. differently, and maybe to to keep with the uh, the surfing metaphor, um, 
you 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 don't construct the wave. You know, you you catch it. Right. Like the the wave's moving in towards the shore. And you have the opportunity to either attempt to surf it, get lost up in it, yeah. uh halfway drown in it, um which is usually what happens when I try to surf. It's quite a sight. Wipe out. Um but but you're you're not constructing the wave. The wave been constructed and you simply attempt to ride on it and maybe you'll fail the first but few times. But I do hear I do hear Kathleen's concern though that it will become like the wave that Patrick Swayze rides at the end of <laughs> Point Break, where it's one that you don't recover from, and that the, or, or perhaps a better one, Deep Impact, where that huge tidal wave is coming at yeah. them, and it's just it's going to crush everything in its path. Yeah. And there are a lot of folks out there that you don't want to crush with the wave. Right. Right. You don't want to take them. Did you like that? Those were two really bad move metaphors. No, they I- were. And MSNBC was not properly represented on uh, on Deep Impact. Right. I'm not really sure if they just got like the the okay to use the the graphic. Just but as, anyway, as long as no one references Waterworld, I'm good. No, we won't do. <laughs> <laughs> it's like in Waterworld. That one, no. It's like but an it, Il Postino. Yeah. yeah you, just, you 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 want you want folks to catch the wave and right. to get on board the proverbial surfboard, but but I definitely I mean there is a a sensitivity. Certainly, that that I, that we have to maintain too. So this is why there's a lot more more wise people out there yeah. than than me who who hopefully can figure out this balance. Yeah. yeah, that's why I think the education you know aspect of it is so important. Like, you know, I w- most everyone here gets it because we have either educated ourselves or have been through some kind of theology training. Uh, you know, we need to reach young adults in or you know young people really. Mm-hmm. And we need to teach that, you know, we, it goes back to what, you know, talking about beating the dead horse goes back to how do we water down our faith when we teach our children? Yeah. You know, if within the family unit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, you're, coming, you're going back to, you know, Sunday school, you know, and then now, of course, they're with young kids. There needs to be some kind of simplification. But, you know, when does that simplification end? Mm. You know, and we're, and, you know, I'm seeing it in, in high school still going on. Yeah. You know, this, well, they're not going to get that, you know, that. Yeah. Well, if you're that, 45 now, right. when, <laughs> when do you think might be the time to start stepping it up? Yeah. They won't understand or they won't be interested in the fact that Christ is a new sacrificial lamb from the Old Testament. Yeah, they will. You know, like. <laughs> yeah, so, definitely yeah. they will. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, so it's the idea of going to surf school, you know. Yeah. Go to school. You got to learn how to surf to get on that, you know, to get on that wave. And that's, I think the education part is what's. What's most important is is why we do what we do because it is beautiful and when you understand, you know why why the mass is done the way it is. Yeah. Um, There's and, a reason the priest wears that funny yeah. wetsuit. Or just the words that are said, you know, and like you know, as you're as you're going through mass, you know, taking a liturgy course yeah. changed my whole world. And I was three years into college and I've been Catholic my whole life, you know. But yep. I, I, somebody finally said, hey, listen, this is the good stuff that's going on. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Tripping on liturgy. I want a little piece of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, G- D.P. Pearson, uh, ever present in the chat room, says, uh, perhaps the key to worship is to do your best to worship in the way God has revealed he wills it to be. Which, again, is uh, kind of part and parcel to the sacred texts being protected <laughs> and not innovated outside of what the church intends. Yeah. Um, because the, the the church reveals to us the way that we as Catholics believe that, that God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, Jesus set up a church. He intended it, you know? Yeah. Um, he's a setting the stage, quote, quote, uh, paraments, investments, important stuff. Um, he says you, you've got to prepare the altar for the holy sacrifice. Yeah. It's got to be done uh, in a real way. And it's amazing how that goes a long way. I was surprised myself, you know, just by removing some of the... Um, more abstract things and placing in some things that are just beautiful, you know, because when you have, when you have inherently unapologetically beautiful things in the sanctuary, um, it's, it's almost like whenever you go to, uh, to your grandma's house and she's got all these beautiful old things on the wall, you know, you just, there's something special and set apart about this house, Mm -hmm. about this place and visiting with this woman. It's almost like going to see a queen, you know? Yeah. Whereas you go to your crazy aunt's place and <laughs> she's got a kimono and there's all these sort the of... 80s cats. Yeah. 80s deco stuff. <laughs> Lots of cats. <laughs> Love <Lava> work. <laughs> Sadly, that will be me one day. Just be nice. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Father Chris, did you have any, any opposite reactions to that at all? To the changes that you made? Kind of like you were... Yeah, you well, were 
trying to change too much. Yes, and and I still, uh, to some degree, have uh, have have to deal with the fallout of that because again, anytime um, I would say that the majority of the folks appreciate what's happening because mm-hmm. we've been in a dearth for so long, mm-hmm. um, where the liturgy has become kind of just something to do on Sunday, um, and uh, and so anytime you introduce something that whether it is radical or it is simply perceived as radical, you get a little bit of pushback. I can't say, I mean, I wasn't ridden out of town on a rail, but uh, the, the, only, the only time that that really would begin to happen is whenever you begin to, to, um, to impact the music situation. Uh. Um, because <laughs> even, even if the music is bad to begin with, Mm-hmm. Anytime people. you begin a dialogue with people who uh, are involved in music, anytime you talk to artists, basically. <laughs> artists. Yeah. Um, yes. You're going to get into it because you're going to have a class of ideologies, even if mm-hmm. one party doesn't understand an ideology in the first place. You know, whether you understand an ideology or not, you've got one. And, yeah. uh, and, and so that's why in most parishes, the choir kind of rules the roost when it comes to the liturgy. You know, mm-hmm. um, but uh, that has been allowed to happen to a great degree. Right. And, uh, I, I mean, not that I would ever do it. I thankfully I haven't ever had to be put in that situation. But uh, that's why I wouldn't have any problem saying, "Well, listen, choir, um, this is the way that it needs to be done, and we'll have no music until we can figure out a way to do this." You know, I, I I wouldn't want to do wow. that. But you know, the liturgy is the one non-negotiable thing. Yeah, that we do as Catholics, um, as D.P. Pearson said in the chat room, and it's it's true. Um, how to celebrate it is is laid out, and the norms are even there. And even though there is a wide scope of what we can allow within the liturgy, within music and things of that nature, it's got to be done with the right aim, you know. Um, and and that's that's a that's a toughie. Yeah, because trying to teach what I I found that there was such a resistance to change. Um, just even with the the new Roman Missal, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the new yeah the new Roman Rite, yeah, and, and and folks who were very faithful Catholics just got really defensive, as if as if they were being told that we've been doing it wrong our whole life, and now yeah. we're going to be provided the right way, yeah. And so, I don't know if that's just a natural human reaction that people have, like something changes, and therefore you have to put up your defenses. Yeah, well, that, but, uh, yeah, I think there's some truth to that because I, I, I did hear that. Well, Father, we've been doing it this way for 25 years, right? Yeah, and what you're, it's, it's, it's like when you when you move something um, that has always been in the dining room, <laughs> right? Know, that 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 ugly blue vase with the flowers <laughs> that are not real, but they have been in that dining room since since before you were born. And then all of a sudden that vase is not there anymore. Well, you hated the vase. The flowers were ugly and moth-eaten, but you wonder where it is. Yeah. And why all of a sudden did we choose now to take the vase out of the dining room? Exactly. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and, and it's not so much that I mind the vase being gone, but I really need to know why it's not there. Sure. Because, <laughs> because I connected with that vase. Mm-hmm. Whenever I saw that vase, well, I remember, you know, this person, that person who sat around the dinner table. I remember the discussions we used to have, and we had to look through that darn vase and it was hideous. It's not there anymore. You know? but, and I didn't even know how passionate I was about the vase until you moved it. Yeah. And suddenly there's, there's a void in my life, mm-hmm. and I'm angry about it. Yeah. And then I will break the vase to show you. No. Uh, yeah. 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 So it's, it, it is one of those things that I don't know that we can solve in a podcast and a half. You know? but, uh, mm. but, but well, well spoken um, by... Uh, by the members here, and also by this blogger. She, she goes on a little bit, too. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure that's, that link's in the show notes. Well, we didn't talk about anything tech. <laughs> I don't think this, this episode, really, unless you, you count Brandon Vaught, you know? This is not the show I thought I was coming on this week. I? That's right. You, you were all teched out and ready to go. <laughs> I was, and we went all heavy. Yeah, we did. Well, it we was know. a heavy show. Anytime well, you bring a Pope or four. Yeah, well, because we missed it all last week. Last week was... Good point. You know, was we, all we weren't, levity. We weren't here last week. Oh, right. That's right. true. So it's two Wait weeks. a minute. I still showed up to do a show in my head. No, you didn't. <laughs> on Sunday? Oh, in your head, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I'm about to say. Hmm. No, actually, we were... I bet it was great. It we was were, wonderful. We were barbecuing. <laughs> Best show ever. That's right. There was. There was a birthday barbecue. 
Because someone last week yeah. had a birthday. Yeah, I'm now a year younger than Jesus. Oh, cool. <laughs> Before he went to the cross. So that means my crucifixion is imminent. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I don't I don't have my sounder ready there. <laughs> but of course yeah. Happy birthday anyway. That's right. <laughs> Happy birthday. That is the correct answer. Yeah. So, as you careen towards crucifixion. As I careen towards <laughs> my passion. Yeah. That wouldn't that be an interesting like Wait a minute, where is this going? <laughs> wouldn't, that be an, wouldn't that be an interesting way of the cross? Father Chris's way of the cross. On next week's show. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Oh, I'll tell you what, you mess with that music, uh, you know. It might yeah. get there sooner than never mind. I mean. You never know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but so it's been two weeks of good stuff that we we're catching up on. That's right. Yeah, yeah in fact, it, it never fails. If we cancel a show, watch. If we were to cancel next week's show, um, what would happen? Um, they would decide that they're going to move Rome to Constantinople again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would just be this huge <laughs> deal, you know. Whenever we cancel a show, something something happens. We used to really feel like on two guys a girl on the Catholic podcast as well. It was just there. Were, it was all. I think we took the week off that Pope Benedict announced his resignation. Yeah, and you're just like seriously. Mm-hmm. Mm. Really, really, you're going to do that? In fact, that's why we had to do a CU special, is because I think we that's were right. we were in between uh, episodes at the time, mm-hmm. and Father Ryan and I. It was Mardi Gras weekend. That's oh, why I remember it because right. I was I was up visiting him, and uh, I woke up. At six o'clock, well, earlier than six o'clock in the morning, with uh, Roberto's text, uh, the Pope's resigning, and that Roberto, who stays up at all hours of the night, uh, a legendary figure. he is a legendary figure. That's right. Uh, I'm thinking, well, what? It, like, is he asking? Are we writing a story together, or is this just a thought that he's having? Or, and sure enough, no, it was happening. Wow. Yeah. That could be fun, though, if you just start texting people, like, the first line of a story, and then you have to text back and forth. And I do that. Construct something. Do you? Yeah. Wow, you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, hold on. I've, I've got one well, now. My phone's disappeared. Oh, well. Anyway. Bum, bum, we, we share digits later, Chris Williston. Your geekdom abounds, sir. Yeah. <laughs> That's I'm glad you found a new friend. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is an old friend. Old friend. We go way back. Yeah, to at least 2011. Oh. At least. At least. Well, there you go. Yeah. But I don't think that we ever actually encountered each other's geekitude until uh, the Austin Catholic News. Well, now it really thing. is like, like, you know, like a new friend. That's true. Well, I t- I've already told him I'm going to invade his home and visit with which, his wife and children. Which we invite. <laughs> Be very we careful do. with that. <laughs> we just need to figure out when. Yeah, it's exactly. Really well, I know. I need to, to plan an Austin trip. I really do. The mighty, mighty comfy couch out there, Father. Oh, I do like couches. Hey, he doesn't take up a lot of room, I'll tell you that. He, he doesn't eat a lot anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, that barbecue, there is copious barbecue at the, oh, in Austin. Yummy, I know there is. Yeah. I hear a lot of good things about Austin. Yeah, there you go. Giving well, it all I got, Cotton. <laughs> that's right, Mary Kate still has not quite learned. Well, yeah. I'm handling cameras. <laughs> oh, Jack. That's right, that's right. She is. <laughs> anyway. well, we're going to have to put a lavalier on her. Or one of those, um, I got a, I got one of those headset, headset things, countryman. like Britney yeah. Spears. <laughs> we could, we could put a, a countryman on her. Yeah, that would work. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess we should uh, kick the tires and light the fires and uh, let everybody go their separate ways. So All we'll right. just go ahead and do that. All righty. Well, this was the see you later. You've stuck with us, and hopefully, you've got some uh, good things to bring to your liturgy planning meetings in your parish. I'm Father Chris Decker, um, which I'm going to say again in a minute because <laughs> I did this out of order. Uh, Jeff Blackwell, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Father. Mary Kate Taylor, running cameras and doing a great job. No problem. And then, of course, we got uh, Kathleen Lee. Good die. <laughs> and Chris Williston, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. My pleasure. And, and you'll be back again, as I understand it. Indeed, two weeks. Very good. Well, we'll be uh, waiting with bated breath and maybe I'll text you with some story ideas for no particular reason please and again as I said I'm Father Chris Decker you can catch us every week uh, at 7pm Central Daylight Time for the radio show and then for this version the See You Later which is the show after the show which is also a show we'll see you later later